and welcome to the um, annual Lucian Strike and National Translation Award reception. I want to thank a few people real quick, quickly. Um, we didn't have an uh, opening this morning of the conference, so I'm going to take a couple of minutes right now to thank uh, some of the people th who made this possible. Um, some of you who came to the reception last night um, know that at least one of our sponsors was Chad Post and Open Letter Press. Also, um, a yes, thank you. Um, uh, Amazon Crossing uh, is uh, helping to support the event. The Milwaukee Public Library Central, uh, where we're having some readings. Uh, Seth Schuster and the People's Cooperative Bookstore that is uh, staffing the book exhibit on the fifth floor. Um, the Alta Travel Fellowship Selection Committee, and wasn't that a fantastic reading just before this? <laughs> Sincere thanks to the selection committee, which this year consisted of um, three people, Esther Allen, Susan Harris, and Jason Grunab Grunabaum. Thanks very much for, for all your hard work. We had a ton of good applications this year. Um, we also uh, have benefited uh, greatly from the organizational skills of um, Alta's managing director, Erica Mena. Where is she? And uh, Brandy Host and her colleagues at IU conferences who are making things run. Thank you. Where are you? as well as a number of student assistants and volunteers, including uh, my graduate assistants, Brittany Penzer and Rachel Dom. Where are you? You're here somewhere. And also um, intern Sarah uh, Corcoran. A special thanks to Alexis Leviton, who continues to organize the bilingual readings, which have grown exponentially. We're going to have to figure out how to handle them. They're, they've just taken off. Um, I think I mentioned last night that at the Bloomington Conference last year, we had a record 85, 86 bilingual readings, which was 20 more than Alexis could remember uh, ever getting in, tw in 26 years of, of administering that um, uh, initially surreptitious book guerrilla movement in the Alta conference. And this year we had 136, I believe. Um, so, I don't know, it's like double the number uh, that we had two years ago or more. I also want to thank Marion Schwartz for helping with the, um, for coaching the, the bilingual, sorry, the, um, the, uh, uh, Alta Fellows this year and for emceeing the event just before this one. Thank you, Marion. And tomorrow night um, uh, at Declamacion, you'll see the, um, the results of ba Barbara Pashke's work. Uh, thank you, Barbara, in advance for organizing the De Declamacion again this year. And finally, no conference would happen without an organization committee. Um, this year's committee was led by Leah Leone, uh, who is um, at University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and she's stepped out for the moment, but she uh, is our leader here. And then um, the rest of the committee members, Erica Mena, uh, Aaron Aji, uh, Kathy Nelson, Avia Kushner, Sybil and Forrester, and Kyle Semmel. So thank you, everybody. So I have the honor of um, introducing two uh, winners. I want to introduce more than two, though, um, because we have tried to expand this, um, this uh, process a little bit to reflect the high quality of um, uh, submissions that we get across the board in the Lucian Strike uh, Prize and the National Translation Award. Um, and so I want to mention that we're having a long list reading of uh, National Translation Award finalists. Um, uh, tomorrow, um, and I believe they are Karen Kovacic, Jason Grunebaum, Stephen Kessler, and Bill Johnston. So if you have time to come out and listen to them, I th and some of these people are also reading at the Public Library, um, which is a, a, a public uh, event open to everybody, not just ticketed uh, Alta members, convention uh, members, um, attendees. And uh, also, um, 
I want to uh, name our finalists. I'm going to give those in a few, minute, few minutes. The long list and the short list this year, we made a great effort to publicize and to get them out into the um, various media outlets so that people knew who was actually um, uh, nominated and made, made their way to the finalist round. Um, first, I want to introduce and announce the winner of the Lucian Strike Prize um, by starting with the runner-up. Um, um, and this year, the, the runner-up for the prize um, was a book published by uh, White Pine Press called Magnolia, Magnolia and Lotus, Selected Poems of Hye Sim, which was translated from the Korean by Ian Haight and Tae Yong Ho. And that's the runner-up for the Lucian Strike Prize. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> that committee, I should note, forget the selection committee for that prize this year we were still we were still in slight transition mode so the committees were not um, the committee as as you know and everything used to be administered by the office in university at the University of Texas at Dallas and some of the operations have still have during the year had we had a we had a collaborative arrangement let me put it that way and so this year the the selection committee for the for the Lucian strike prize would actually consisted of um, Jonathan Stalling, Janet Kim Ha, and Reiner Schulte. Um, and they actually, uh, ad they not only administered the prize, but they worked with the publishers getting the submissions, and we owe a debt of gratitude to the Dallas office for continuing to do that even after our official arrangement with them had ended. So thank you very much for doing that. And um, so, I want to introduce now the winner of the Lucian Strike Prize, who's going to come up and um, read a little bit from, and tell you a little bit about the, the book, the project, and uh, read a little bit from it. And um, this year's winner is uh, Every Rock, a Universe, the Yellow Mountains, and Chinese Travel Writing, translated and introduced by Jonathan Chaves. Um, it's a book by Wang Hongdu. And, um, Jonathan is a distinguished translator from the Chinese and also a poet. He has uh, his own poetry published in a variety of literary magazines, Antioch Review, and a number of others. His work has been nominated for the National Book Award in the translation category. Um, he, he presents the, the first complete translation of Wang Hongdu's poetry in a Western language, and his translation shows, according to the selection committee, a translator who recreates the world of Wang with a refined sensitivity to the nuances of the Chinese language and the underlying cultural and aesthetic landscape of the Yellow Mountains expressed in poetry and prose. Please welcome Jonathan Chaves. Uh, it is a great, great pleasure to be here. I am absolutely delighted by this award and completely and utterly surprised that a book of this sort would be selected. The writer is completely unknown uh, anywhere, including in China. Uh, this is the first time he has been noticed at all, Wang Hongdu. He was a painter, a calligrapher, a poet, and as this book, I think, demonstrates a remarkable master of prose in classical Chinese. And I'm going to be reading some of the Chinese to you in just a few moments, and you will understand that this is what the Chinese call wenyan, or classical literary Chinese. It is not uh, a spoken version of the Chinese language. Huangshan, or the Yellow Mountains, located in southern Anhui province. I'm curious to know how many people here have ever gone to the Yellow Mountains in, in China? And do we have any? Is there somebody, somebody back there? Okay, good, good. Um, this is one of the most beautiful places on the face of the planet. Uh, when you go there, you feel as if you are walking through Chinese paintings. And as a matter of fact, the Yellow Mountains inspired an entire school of Chinese painting known as the Xin'an School, 
or the Southern Anhui Province School in the 17th and 18th centuries. The key event that kicked off the great popularity of the Yellow Mountains among the literati, the scholar officials of China, was the tragic invasion and conquering of China by the Manchus in 1644. And the uh, scholars of the day, not being Marxist in their inspiration, uh, Marx was not yet born, did not consider that historical events are caused by mysterious social and economic forces, nor did they consider that history is brought about by conflicts among classes. They considered that it was brought about by moral integrity or a failure of moral integrity. This is the classical Confucian philosophy. And the loss of moral integrity had caused heaven, Tian, to withdraw the mandate to rule. Tian had, re had withdrawn the, the uh, Ming, the mandate to rule. They looked to the Yellow Mountains as a place where perhaps the essence of classical Chinese civilization with its moral and spiritual foundations might still be recovered. And so some of them simply refused to take the civil service examinations and serve in the government, and they would go and live there. Wang Hongdu lived in the heart of the Yellow Mountains for 10 years at a time when the place was completely remote and completely cut off from the outside world. Others became Buddhist monks, and still others were Taoists who would go there to refine the elixir of immortality, the Dan, based on cinnabar. Uh, the term yellow comes, in fact, from Huangdi, the yellow emperor, the founder of Chinese civilization, according to traditional Chinese historiography, who is said to have refined the elixir of immortality right there in the Yellow Mountains. So trips there became a pilgrimage to a place not only of great beauty, stark and austere, but great, great beauty, but also a pilgrimage back toward the origins of Chinese civilization. Huangshan Ling Yao Lu, or Comprehending the Essentials of the Yellow Mountains, is Wang Hongdu's brilliant collection of prose essays about the Yellow Mountains, describing them and talking about what they meant to him and his peers. The mountains were famous for their rock formations, for their pine trees, which have their own botanical name in modern botany, the um, Huangshanensis pine, the pine of the Yellow Mountains. Can, they cannot be found anywhere else. They grow, as, as it were, out of rock without any place to root themselves in soil. They are twisted by the winds into dragon-like shapes, the, and they all have names uh, that are given to them. And then finally, the Ocean of Clouds, or Yunhai, also known as Huanghai, the Yellow Ocean, because when you stand in these mountains, all of a sudden, clouds or mists will come swirling up out of nowhere, form incredible patterns, and then disappear. And I'd like to start, in fact, with a passage descriptive of the clouds in the Yellow Mountains. Um, first, let's listen to it in uh, classical Chinese, although I would caution you that it comes along with something that did not exist in the 17th century, a Brooklyn accent. Tianyu Ping 
汝蓬莱岛屿高至天，风海桃上，仙山楼阁，历历不言也。如芙蓉万朵，丛生湖光，见艳中，因风摇扬，不定也。Okay, now <clears throat> the same passage translated, and I will add a bit more. You wouldn't think that this much could be written about clouds by anyone but a scientist who specializes in clouds. By the way, do we have any of those in the audience today? No? Thank God, because I probably made all kinds of mistakes in capturing some of the uh, terms that describe the clouds. The clouds go along with the winds sweeping and burgeoning above and below until there is a great divide formed with heaven's vault above all, a perfect blue, while below in the midst of the cottony forms, beams of sunlight flicker and penetrate and the forms of the peaks following these sometimes peak out and sometimes are again swallowed up while purplish, bluish, greenish forms produce thousands and thousands of aureoles and thousands and thousands of types of scintillating light. And that is why everything beyond the mountains is one vast panorama of voidness, as even as the surface of a mirror, while within the mountain, it is as if thousands of skeins of silk are twisting and turning, floating and dangling amongst the crevices of all the peaks above all is zigzagged. Below, all is perfectly level. It is like the Isle Mountains of Paradise jutting upwards toward heaven. Oh, so the Chinese believed that there were mountain islands of paradise way out in the ocean where Shenren or immortals lived. So now the tips of the peaks protruding above the clouds have that appearance. While in the windswept ocean waves, the towers and pavilions of the mountains of the immortals glitter clearly one after the other unobstructed. Or it is like tens of thousands of lotus blossoms growing together or scintillating wavelets of lake light shaking and swaying in the breeze and never settling down. I have heard from those who have grown old living in these mountains that the clouds actually have homes they come from a particular mountain and will inevitably return to that same mountain. On hot summer days, in windswept rain, the dragon clouds arise and fade. At such times, it is difficult to keep track of them in the haze. And there would seem to be no way to determine if the clouds of all the near and far mountains are in fact facilitated by yellow mountain clouds, but indeed, they are. He's referring to the, to the belief that, mount, that clouds emerged not from water, not from oceans, not from lakes, but from mountains. The mountains were the roots of the clouds. Same cloud would always come out of the same cave and return to it at the end of the day. A cloud commuter, you might call it. I have further heard that once in the past there was a visitor here who was seated at his mountain window grinding his ink and painstakingly working at poetry. When a cloud suddenly flew in through the window, approached his desk, totally absorbed the liquid ink, and then departed, leaving his inkstone as dry as if it had been rubbed clean. The cloud had stolen his ink. Now, of course, before the era of modern tourism to the Yellow Mountains, which has been facilitated by the government in the form of lan che, or cable cars that have been erected there. Uh, getting through was extremely, extremely difficult. And we have some descriptions of how this was done. For example, as one proceeds to the south, one sees yet another sheer cliff face. He's describing a group of climbers being led into the Yellow Mountains by a guide. 
usually a Buddhist monk who's living there as a hermit, hundreds of feet high and broad. There are no crevices or fissures one can grasp hold of, nor are there any places where withered tree branches could be set. The leader informs one that this is the cliff of the king of hell. And at the top lies a ridge known as poison dragon back, which is even worse. But once past this ladder, it becomes possible to reach the summit with no further difficulty. Once an announcement to this effect has been made, the climbers tentatively crawl, crab-like, up the cliff until the halfway point where there is a transverse crack barely a foot or so in width. Above it protrudes a rock which presses right against one's body, preventing one from standing here. But if one reaches into the mouth of the crack, one can reach inside it and grab hold of some pine roots and thus manage to advance several tens of feet. A gigantic pine tree next blocks one's way, lying nearly horizontal. Were one to grasp the trunk around and pass under, one's way would still be obstructed and ascent would still be impossible. Now at the very top of the cliff protrudes a knob of rock the size of a fist. If one crawls along to the tip of the pine tree, which is growing horizontally out of the cliff, if you crawl to the very tip of it so that you're now thousands of feet above the, the uh, valley below and secures the rope to this knob at one end and wraps it at the other around one's body and then swings one's entire body free, hanging in the void from the rope, one can pull oneself up by the rope as if by a hanging thread. And upon reaching the top, one can hang the rope back down to the next climber and who can attach it to his waist and thus also ascend to the top by leaping into the void. Now, finally, I would like to read just one passage about the various animals that live in the Yellow Mountains, which captured Wang Hongdu's attention. And some of what he reports about them uh, stretches one's credibility a bit. He is talking here about monkeys, that is gibbons, or yuan, and uh, these gibbons are so beloved to the Chinese that there was a famous painter in the 11th century named Yi Yuanji who painted nothing but gibbons. It was the only thing he would paint, something like Joseph Albers and squares. And his masterpiece is a hand scroll called 100 Gibbons, no two of which are in the same position. There are mother gibbons with baby gibbons. After he was done with that, he said, I put aside my brush, I have done my life's work. Now, Wang Hung Du tells us that there are two groups of gibbons in the Yellow Mountains, immortal ones, which have eaten the leftover elixir of immortality and now can live for thousands of years, if not forever, and ordinary ones. For the immortal gibbons of the mountains, Two gray ones for every white one do not flock together with the ordinary gibbons. When the climate is clear and lovely, they will freely emerge to observe the cloud sea below, white ones crouched on the rocks looking like snow. The mountain monks call them old snow gentlemen. If they raise their hands to wave at one of them, he will look up, yawn, and gazing at them respond with a gesture of his hand. As for the gray ones, their whiskers too are entirely white. Often they seem to serve the white ones, one on each flank, scratching their backs or massaging their bellies as if they were servitors, not daring to stand upright in the presence of their masters. Few are those who get to see this. The other gibbons form troops and do not reside in any fixed location. When they pass through a gully beneath the cliffs, they inevitably search out the most hidden, remote spots, 
eating all the flowers and fruits that they can find there until these are exhausted, and only then do they head elsewhere. Throughout the mountain, these gibbons will form troops and then form themselves into a circle. And if one goes out to observe them, upon numbering them, it always turns out that each troop has precisely 99 gibbons. If, a hun if the hundredth gibbon comes along, they, they scat them away. Their fur is greenish yellow, not limited to a single color. It is warm and thick, suited to resist the cold. But when everything freezes over, the troop will huddle all together, forming a huge ball, and then roll along the cliff tops. Those gibbons on the inside of the ball will, after a long while, rotate to the outside, changing places with the gibbons there, who take their places within. And thus they continue rotating places without cease. The people of the mountain call this the Yuan Chiu, the ball of gibbons. <laughs> I will uh, end with a recommendation that you uh, visit the Yellow Mountain sometime. Keep your eye out for the ball of gibbons. Uh, and uh, if you manage to see it, please send me an email, jchaves at gwu.edu. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much. Um, I heard two, two titles of, of books that are probably now in the works. One experimental volume of poetry called 99 Gibbons, and the other a uh, children's book, The Ball of Gibbons. So I, I have uh, two other announcements about uh, things happening tonight that are after this. Uh, one is in the Monarch Lounge. It is a Banff. Um, reception, and I believe that starts at 8.30, so it's like right after this. And the other is uh, the, uh, given the number of bilingual readings, we uh, devised this last year, and we're going to repeat it this year. It's the Cafe Latino, which will be at La Perla Restaurant, um, which is, um, I'll give you the, the um, address. It's, it's in the book, but it, you have to, you have, it's in the uh, conference book, but you've got to look a little bit. It's at, it's at La Perla Mexican Restaurant, 734 South 5th Street, and that starts at 9 p.m. And there will be readings uh, from, uh, bilingual readings from uh, Latin America, prim primarily, if I, I think they're all from Latin America. And um, Alexis Levitin will be presiding, and there will be a little bit of food there, and I've heard that the place has really good margaritas. So um, please join us for that. All right, well, this year, um, Alex, Alex? Okay, so uh, Katie Silver, who is, who is um, listening very carefully, <laughs> asked me to, to clarify that the Banff reception is for everyone. It is the Banff um, International Literary Translation Center uh, reception, and it is in the Monarch Lounge, which is downstairs in this, in this very building, and it is open to everybody, not just alumni of uh, the Banff residencies. So that starts at 8.30. So I'm going to move on to the National Translation Award. Um, this year uh, we had a, an illustrious committee um, made up of three people. Um, they were, um, read them, they're in the program, but I um, just want to make sure I, I get all the names right. Um, so the committee this year uh, was um, Jessica Cohen, Barbara Epler, and Elaine Katzenberger. Um, thanks very much to, the, to you three for, for judging the, the, um, the finalists and, and selecting a winner.
It was a hard job, I have to say. We had a, a lot of really, really fine entries. And um, as you can tell from the short list, actually the long list which was published, and then the short list which I'm going to read you, um, it was just a, a very difficult decision to, to come up with a winner, and they, they had their work come out, cut out for them. Um, the, the long, sorry, the short list was um, the, the five, I believe, one, two, three, four, five, five books, finalists, Between Friends by Amos Oz, translated from the Hebrew by Sandra Silverstone, and Invitation for Me to Think by Alexander Vidensky, translated from the Russian by Eugene Ostashevsky and Matvey Yankilevich, Life's Good Brother by Nazim Hikmet, translated from the Turkish by Mutlu Konuk Blazing, A Treatise on Shelling Beans by uh, Wisław uh, Miswipski, uh, translated from the Polish by Bill Johnston, and Theme of Farewell and After Poems by Milo De Angelis, translated from the Italian by Susan Stewart and Patrizio Cecagnoli. So a really fine list, um, and uh, you can read more about um, each one of them uh, at the website, um, which each one has a little blurb and a little description, and why each one might have been uh, a winner. In this case, I have one to announce. And I'm going to invite the winner to come up and, and uh, do a little reading, reading for us. Um, it is um, two people, actually, and that should give you a clue. The winner this year is Alexander Vidensky, An Invitation for Me to Think, which was translated by um, Eugene Ostashevsky and Matvey Yankilevich. Um, <laughs> congratulations. So Eugene, um, Eugene couldn't make it. He's, I think he's over. I think he's in Berlin at the time, at the at the moment, and he couldn't make it. But Matvey is here. Um, let me say a couple words about Eugene uh, because he's not here, and then I'll say a couple more about Matvey because he is. Uh, Eugene Ostashevsky uh, was born in 1968 in Leningrad uh, in the USSR, and he grew up in New York after his family immigrated in 1979. Um, as a translator from Russian, Ostashevsky focuses primarily on the late 1920s and early 1930s, uh, underground circle led by Daniel Harms and Alexander Videnski. In addition to Videnski's An Invitation for Me to Think, he has edited the first English language collection of their writings called uh, Abiryu, Ob Obiryu, I don't know how you say that in English, Abiryu is the Russian, an anthology of Russian absurdism with contribute Contributions by Matvey Yanklevich. It was published by Northwestern University in 2006. His as yet unpublished project on Abiru, Conversations by Leonid Lipovsky, won a translation fellowship from the NEA, and he is currently preparing an edition of Tango with Cows, a 1913 book of visual poetry by the Russian futurist Vasily Kam Kaminsky, which won the Penn Heim Award. He also edited and co-translated collections by the contemporary Russian poets Dmitry Galinko, as it turned out, uh, which was published by Ugly Duckling Press in 2008, and Arkady uh, Dragomoshchenko uh, in Darkment Selected Poems, by West, uh, published by Wesleyan University Press in 2014. Uh, finally, his Moonlighting in Italian as a co-translator of Elisa Biagini's the, the Guest in the Woods helped win the 2014 Best Translated Book Award from 3% um, uh, this, this year, I guess, earlier this year. So, um, and then Matvey, I have to say a couple of words about Matvey and then let him come up and talk about the project and then do a little reading. Uh, Matvey Yankelevich is a founding editor and volunteer for Ugly Duckling Press, where, among other projects, he curates the Eastern European Poets series. He is the author of a poetry collection, Alpha Donut, United Artists Books, and the novella in Fragments, Boris by the Sea, published by Octopus Books, and several chapbooks. His translations of Daniel Harms were collected in Today, I Wrote Nothing, the selected writings of Daniel Harms in the Artist series Overlook Press. He is an itinerant lecturer, uh, today wandering among us, currently teaching poetry at Wesleyan, Wesleyan University and the Art of the Book and Translation as Writing at Columbia's School of the Arts. Among other season, seasonal jobs, he is a member of the writing faculty at the Milton Avery Graduate School of the Arts at Bard College. Please welcome Matvey Yankelevich.
Wow, thank you. I'm really nervous. <laughs> um, is it Khrushchev that said, I'll bury you? And uh, that is the correct pronunciation of the group that Harms and Videnski were part of, Oberiu. Right? You just, that's an easy way to remember it. <laughs> Thank you for that, Russell. Um, Eugene um, has uh, sent me a couple of things he wanted to say, and I had a couple of things I wanted to say, and I'm um, ecstatic and kind of um, really nervous in front of all of you. Uh, so um, Eugene was sorry for not being able to come to the conference. Uh, his uh, wife just gave birth to a child, their second daughter, uh, last week uh, in Berlin. Um, and now he's teaching in Paris right now, I think. Um, so um, uh, we are both, uh, as translators, deeply honored uh, to receive this award, um, but we are also, and maybe most grateful on behalf, on our author's behalf. Uh, Videnski, uh, born in 1904, died in 1940. Um, uh, when he died uh, on a prison train 73 years ago, uh, very few had read his work, and uh, uh, there was very little chance that anyone would read his poetry, unpublished and scattered as it was. Uh, yet, um, he would have been yet another unknown uh, of that century, uh, expunged from existence, voice and all. Uh, to quote John Berryman, he went over everyone and nobody's missing. Often he reckons in the dawn them up. Nobody is ever missing. Uh, Eugene has, uh, well, I should say, so, much of Videnski's work is lost also because it was, uh, it's, it's simply not extant in, in Russian. Um, and very little of it is read what is published in Russia. So in a way, this uh, award allows it a kind of life that it doesn't actually naturally have. It's sort of the unnatural aspects or of, uh, of, of translation. Um, uh, and uh, Eugene has described his um, translation uh, work as a performance with intentionality, almost like an interpretive dance with and by a particular poet in a particular language at a particular time. Um, the, this, uh, um, uh, for, well, for me, I, I guess he speaks for me too. Um, we translate with uh, philological knowledge of the original as scholars, but because we're both American poets born in Russia and brought up in Russian poetry, um, we're uh, not, uh, the denotative approach uh, for us is insufficient. We can't stop hearing things. Um, and uh, prosody, which can't, uh, emigrate as easily, as even as easily, as difficultly as we did, um, uh, can, can't emigrate so easily and its meaning, uh, the meaning of its prosodic moves, um, of an author's prosodic moves are unique to it, the language and the period. So we, um, so are our, um, our own prosodic moves, Eugene's and mine. Um, so it's pretty horribly subjective what we're doing. Um, Eugene and I first started translating Videnski around 88, and uh, we didn't know each other then. We met in 2000 in New York, thanks to Zhenya Trotsky and Thomas Epstein, uh, who are like our matchmakers, who showed Eugene my draft of uh, Rug Hydrangea, which I'll read in a second. Um, and uh, he said something very touching in this email. He said that, uh, I should say that I'm his dearest, fr a dearest friend, and uh, he hopes the feeling is mutual. Indeed, it is, and it's. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of um, embarrassed though because um, it's a real pleasure to have done this book with him, but especially and to win this award with him, but especially because he did most of the work. <laughs> Except now I have to be up here, so I guess I. Okay, so uh, 
I want to read uh, just a very short statement by Eugene about, I asked him to write, about, uh, write a little bit about what he thinks about Videnski's role in contemporary uh, Russia in, in, for, for um, the political climate. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Videnski once said that his work carried out a poetic critique of language. He was referring to his practice of combining linguistic units in rationally non-decodable ways, which he called meaninglessness, or bismyslitsa in Russian. A historian of the international avant-garde would class bismyslitsa alongside Dada and perhaps futurist language experiments. A historian of philosophy, however, might see his poetic, Videnski's poetic work as taking place in the arc between Nietzsche and Wittgenstein, or perhaps even Wittgenstein and Wittgenstein. But in a specifically Russian context, despite all the genealogies of early 20th century language philosophy and linguistic experiments, it is hard to see Videnski's protest uh, before the mendacity of or ordinary language as being independent of the invasion of ordinary language by Soviet and especially Stalinist newspeak. In newspapers, in the workplace, in the communal apartments, in other words, outside and inside, language was turned into a machine for the manufacture of ideological fictions. A poet who, in such uh, a linguistic environment, asks, how do we write in a language that's false, cannot be viewed as an apolitical poet. In Russia, Videnski is the main classical reference point for the younger artists of the opposition today, most famously for Pussy Riot. In that sense, he has taken the canonical place that Mandelstam held for their parents. The way his writing evades conventional structures, the way it offers the reader constellations instead of isolatable figures, this already makes Videnski a more contemporary poet aesthetically than are most poets who are more contemporary chronologically. But it is his poetic critique of language, his insistent questioning how one may write in a language that's false, what kind of sense can be made when, ask, when making sense makes no sense, that makes him a central figure for today. Because we too live in a linguistic universe colonized by ideologies. We too live in a linguistic universe where, uh, to paraphrase, much ado about nothing, we may very well ask, are our words our own? Whom do I mean by we here? Of course, I mean the Russians, whose government has taken over virtually all media, with the result that it submits its citizens to unrelenting, unimpeded, and excellently choreographed, an excellently choreographed barrage of propaganda. But it is hard to think that we, we in the States, although not subject to a single all-embracing propaganda campaign, but many campaigns, some of which cancel each other out, while others reinforce yet others, are, how can we put it, the subjects of our own language. We are not. We are spoken through, sometimes in consciously manipulative ways by political or corporate entities, sometimes less consciously, but always for someone's profit, whether financial or psychological. Linguistic manipulation surrounds us. We absorb it. We unwittingly inflict it on others. This is why Videnski's question, how do we write in a language that's false, is also our question. Um, my hope is that translation in some way, and what everybody here in this room is doing, in some way uh, directs itself at this project, or this problem, by projecting language into the foreground of their work and attention. Um, I'd like to also thank um, uh, I thank all of you and thank also the publishers who brought out this book, um, uh, Edwin Frank and Jeffrey uh, Yang at uh, uh, NYRB Poets, the New Poets series. Um, I also want to thank uh, posthumous, sort of uh, in absentia or whatever, uh, Daniel Harms and Yakov Druskin, two friends of Videnski, uh, who actually held on to Videnski's manuscripts uh, a, gestures, a gesture that we forget the necessity of uh, today. Um, so, uh, and uh, in the 30s, uh, um, in the 1920s and 30s, um, Videnski wrote uh, these works, and I'm going to read, um, I think, just two um, pieces. 
one in, in Eugene's translation first. And maybe I'll read a little bit of the Russian. Um, and then if you want, I can keep reading while you go drink somewhere. <laughs> um, let's see. But first, Russell will tell you where. Or maybe not. I don't know. He already told you, I think. Um, so, oh, God. Uh, let me, okay. This is uh, The Soldier ABC, translated by Eugenia Stashevsky. Along the shore of the resounding sea walked the soldier ABC. He had a fundamental guiding thought about nuts. He walked and whispered a song. It was evening. The soldier ABC approached a pitiful unlit by the inhabitant fisherman, fisherman's hut where fishermen lived, provided they were not out navigating the resounding black Caspian or essentially even the Mediterranean or, which is one and the same, the Adriatic Sea, but were ashore, that's when they lived there. They, the fishermen, were five in number. They intently ate soup with fish. Their names were André, Bandré, Bendré, Gandré, and Coudedré. They all had daughters. Their names were Lyalya, Talya, Balya, Kyalya, and Salya. The daughters had all gotten married. It was evening. The soldier ABC did not stop by the home of these garden patch minders. He did not knock on their home door. He walked deep in his thought, the fundamental guiding him thought about nuts. The soldier ABC did not notice their fisherman's house, not their nets, not their rigging, not their daughters, not their soup. Even though he felt cold and night was falling all the same, he still walked past them. So much was he engulfed by his fundamental guiding thought about nuts. It was evening still. ABC walked, almost ran, and spoke his nut song. Let us imagine that is, let us mentally hear this song. Does it follow from the songs being called nut song that nuts must feature proudly in it? Yes, in this case it follows. It is far from being always so, but in this case it follows. Here it is, that's this song. The soldier ABC sang about the difference in the shells of the walnut and the Brazil nut. Here's what he sang. The shell of the walnut is tender to look at. The shell of the Brazil nut is savage to look at. The former shell is clean, firm, lush, and lean. The latter shell is a simple one. It's like a tailless swan. Why this difference, goodness gracious? Those in the know are horribly pugnacious. I like the walnut before and after. Its body carries a certain laughter. Its shell is mighty fine, but thinking about it is a waste of time. The Brazil nut has color. Maybe the color is its brother. Yet where its dawn gets its start, no one can say either forward or backward. Why this difference? Goodness gracious, those in the know are horribly pugnacious. This is all that I could say about their shell that ends with an A. Here, as if in answer to this song, blazed up the candlelit, previously unlit window of the fisherman's house whose light had gone out entirely and forever. The fishermen André, Bandré, Bendré, and Gandré wrapped his fist on the window and shouted to the soldier ABC, Officer, officer, do you take the world's offer, sir? But the fisherman Coudre self-sufficiently cooked and went on eating his fisherman's soup. It was evening, although also night was falling. But what could ABC say in reply when he didn't hear the question? He was already very far away from them. And then he suddenly, but not unexpectedly, turned into a father and and right away sang a new song. The father sang, the mother listened. The father sang, but the mother listened. The father sang and the mother listened. And what was she listening to? I walked along the city streets. I looked for my son everywhere, but I couldn't find him anywhere, even among the seaside cliffs. Then I walked in to the forest, then I ran towards the sea. Where are you? Where, oh, my son, I cried around me sadly. 
my son answered, here I am, may be I entirely here. Then I looked around myself, my son who, my son wholly disappeared. All the birds put up a howl, cooed the wild animal, cry and cry and cry and cry, the forest cuckooed to them all. The soldier ABC strongly inspired, courageously, we, the text is unfinished. And I'll read uh, a poem, one poem in, um, uh, from just a little earlier, uh, from 1933. Um, oh no, I think um, my phone died where I had the Russian <laughs> technology. <laughs> Anyone know Cyrillic and have an iPhone? <laughs> huh? uh, you can find it uh, in Russian uh, by typing it in Cyrillic, Vidyansky, and uh, you will come upon it very quickly. Um, so, Russell, if you do that, I'll read a, a short um, bit from... Um, uh, from the Gray Notebook uh, in this text, um, and then maybe read that, that poem with a t tiny bit of the Russian. Uh, and this is just apropos of this uh, sort of uh, what Eugene uh, has talked about in the introduction to this book and what we both talked about in other cases, this uh, questioning of language that's going on in the Oberiu um, poets. So I'll read a part from the Gray Notebook, uh, which is also unfinished notebook text of Videnski's from the early 30s. Um, oh, and the poem is, Мне жалко, что я не зверь. Russell, you, you got that? Мне жалко? It's like on the wiki, it's pretty easy to find. Uh, Russian texts, are, they don't have copyrights if they're Russian. Did you know that? <laughs> um, so uh, I'll read this little Apart from the gray notebook first. Before every word I put the question, what does it mean? And over every word I place the mark of its tense. Where is my dear soul Masha and where are her wretched hands and her eyes and other parts? Where does she wandered, murdered or alive? I haven't the strength. Who? I. What? Haven't the strength. I'm alone as a candle. I'm seven minutes past four alone, eight minutes past four as nine minutes past four, a candle, 10 minutes past four. A moment is gone as if it had never been, and four o'clock also, the window also, but everything remains the same. Thank you. Wow, thank you. It gets dark, it gets light, not a dream to be had. Where's the sea? Where's the shade? The notebook, the word, 155 is nearly at hand. And that essay and poem, Gray Notebook, meditates on connections between our language about time and exper subjective experience of time. Um, and then I'll read this last, just one poem uh, to finish. And thank you for your patience and uh, attention um, and uh, thank you to the generous panel that chose this book. Um, I'll just read the beginning in Russian. Мне жалко, что я не зверь, бегающий по синей дорожке, говорящий себе поверь, а другому себе подожди немножко. Мы выйдем с собой погулять в лес для рассмотрения ничтожных листьев. Мне жалко, что я не звезда, бегающая по небосводу в поисках точного гнезда. Она находит себя и пустую земную воду. Никто не слыхал, чтобы звезда издавала скрип. Ее назначение ободрять собственным э, молчанием рыб. Еще есть у меня претензия, что я не ковер, не гортензия. Мне жалко, что я не крыша, распадающаяся постепенно, которой дождь размачивает, у которой смерть не мгновенно. Мне не нравится, что я смертен, мне жалко, что я не точен. Многим-многим лучше, поверьте, частица дня, единица ночи. Мне жалко, что я не орел, 
перелетающей вершины и вершины, которому нам взбрел человек, наблюдающий аршины. Мы сядем с тобою, ветер, на этот камушек смерти. Мне жалко, что я не чаще, мне не нравится, что я не жалость, мне жалко, что я не роща, которая листьями вооружалась. Мне трудно, что я с минутами, меня они страшно запутали. Posthumously, this poem came to be called Rug Hydrangea because those two things repeat. And you'll notice there are some like record skipping qualities in the poem. It's not, it's not me making a mistake, hopefully. They're, they're there in the text. I regret that I'm not a beast running along a blue path, telling myself to believe and my other self to wait a little. I'll go out with myself to the forest to examine the insignificant leaves. I regret that I'm not a star running along the vault of the sky in search of the present perfect nest. It finds itself and earth's empty water. No one has ever heard of a star giving out a squeak. Its purpose is to encourage the fish with its silence. And then there's this grudge that I bear, that I'm not a rug nor a hydrangea. I regret I'm not a roof falling apart little by little which the rain soaks and softens, whose death is not sudden. I don't like the fact that I'm mortal. I regret that I am not perfect. Much, much better, believe me, is a particle of day, a unit of night. I regret that I'm not an eagle flying over peak after peak to whom comes to mind a man observing the acres. I regret I'm not an eagle flying over lengthy peaks to whom comes to mind a man observing the acres. You and I, wind, will sit down together on this pebble of death. It's a pity I'm not a chalice. I don't like that I am not pity. I regret not being a grove which arms itself with leaves. I find it hard to be with minutes. They have completely confused me. It really upsets me terribly that I can be seen in reality. And then there's this grudge that I bear, that I'm not a rug nor a hydrangea. What scares me is that I move not the way that do bugs that are beetles or butterflies and baby strollers and not the way that do bugs that are spiders. What scares me is that I move very unlike a worm. A worm burrows holes in the earth, making small talk with her. Earth, where are things with you, says the cold worm to the earth, and the earth governing those that have passed perhaps keeps silent in reply. It knows that it's all wrong. I find it hard to be with minutes. They have completely confused me. I'm frightened that I'm not the grass that is grass. I'm frightened that I'm not a candle. I'm frightened that I'm not the candle that is grass. To this I have answered, and the trees sway back and forth in an instant. I'm frightened by the fact that when my glance falls upon two of the same thing, I don't notice that they are different, that each lives only once. I'm frightened by the fact that when my glance falls upon two of the same thing, I don't see how hard they are trying to resemble each other. I see the world askew and hear the whispers of muffled liars, and having by their tips the letters grasped, I lift up the word wardrobe, and now I put it in its place. It is the thick dough of substance. I don't like the fact that I'm mortal. I regret that I am not perfect. Much, much better, believe me, is a particle of day, a unit of night. And then there's this grudge that I bear, that I'm not a rug nor a hydrangea. I'll go out with myself to the woods for the examination of insignificant leaves. I regret that upon these leaves I will not see the imperceptible words which are called accident, which are called immortality, which are called a kind of roots. I regret that I'm not an eagle flying over peak after peak to whom came to mind a man observing the acres. I'm frightened by the fact that everything becomes dilapidated and in comparison I'm not a rarity. You and I, wind, will sit down together on this pebble of death. Like a candle, the grass grows up all around and the trees sway back and forth in an instant. I regret that I am not a seed. I am frightened I'm not fertility. The worm crawls along behind us all. 
He carries monotony with him. I am scared to be an uncertainty. I regret that I am not fire. Thank you very much. That's the end of our program. Um, uh, there's still food up here, I can see it. So please help yourself, there are drinks back there. Uh, don't forget the Cafe Latino, it starts at nine at La Perla and the Monarch Lounge for the band for reception at 8.30. Thank you all for coming, have a good night.